we're back between two edits, and we're live here from the ISS headquarters for our fifth episode of Behind the Wrap with the ISS. And we have assembled our expert panel. Yes? In a sort of yes. expert yes. panel, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and today's topic is the importance of crew retention for the industry as, as a whole. As a whole. How important it is that they're good, I'm assuming. So, we're going to go straight into it um, with our first panelist, is Mr. Ted Morley. Okay. And what's your, uh, your MPT training? We are. I'm the uh, Chief Operations Officer there. So we do all the regulatory training and all that. And your background is everything. Ships and yachts. Yep. Was raised on them, brought home to a boat when I was three days old and never left. So then, <laughs> three days old? Three days old. <laughs> yep. Wow. And raised sailing on Chesapeake Bay and Long Island Sound and... Uh, Kind of took to my first paid job. I was 15 on a, on a boat. So, yeah, all right. Just worked up to super tankers and cruise ships and container ships. And, and did you ever stuff. finish college? Yes, I did. Oh, you did? Yes. I started college, too. <laughs> 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 okay. There's a lot of crew that uh, captains that never did. Yep. I didn't go to an academy. I, I chose my education separately from my sea time. So I went to sea and then found that education was really important to me. So I went back to uh, get my education also. Cool. So, good stuff. To your right, we have Miss Norma Tre Miss Mrs. Norma Trees, who's been in this industry for your longer, entire life. Longer than I like to count. Um, we all I, have, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I was so interested to uh, hear what Tim just had to say because, uh, just like you, uh, the first time I ever got paid to do anything was working on a yacht, and I was 14 mm. years old in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, helping a friend of mine that had an Allbirk dealership. And um, we sold a lot of boats. He was a high school principal, and his daughter was my best friend. And I did my first transatlantic on a sailboat when I was 17 years old with them, taking a boat. <laughs> um, and that's when I made my first landfall in Antibes, which was, has been a home of mine for a long time, although I'm mainly based which in Which is Fort a Lauderdale. major crew hotspot, isn't it? It is. In the Mediterranean, you know, that, there's the two really big ones, and that's Antibes and Palma. And there's many more today as the yachting industry has grown. Um, and in the years since then, um, uh, I went to college as well, uh, uh, graduated from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, but went to school in Italy and so on and so forth. And you know, finally, I landed full time in the yacht industry um, in my early 20s and um, have never looked back. I spent many years as a charter chef uh, traveling the world on sailboats and motor yachts. And then I started a crew agency called uh, Crew Network um, in my innocence, not that I knew anything about it. One of my great uh, uh, Wonderful placements is uh, Graham Lord, who's standing here next to me, and that was, uh, and he's and he's one of the best, and I wish we had more of those. And um, of course, I placed Graham in his first job on the yacht. My first job through Norma. Yeah, on Southerly. So. Good God! You know <laughs> when was that? I don't know. Right, 80, right 80, 80, 90, 90, 90, <laughs> 93, 94, something like that. Twenty more than twenty-five years ago. Yeah, and uh, and and look at him. He's been an asset, and. Um, you know, so, so Graham and I share going from sea-based to land-based, and I think another thing that he and I share is also support and participation in the yachting industry in general. So we're here with ISS, and I've been a member, a board member, now I'm a board emeritus member, and I'm really active with them. And I work with a lot of other groups, and uh, most recently and heavily, of course, uh, Yachty Global in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian. So I think it's really important that we give back to the industry and um, back to the crew thing, um, I still do crew consultancy and I have several independent clients and I not only place crew, but I work with them a lot in uh, developing programs um, to encourage better people to come to them and also to deal with retention. So I guess we'll be talking more about that later. So that brings us to, normally I come back around this way, but we'll go straight to Graham here. There we go. When we spoke to you about the last panel. Sorry, introduce yourself first. All right, so my name's Graham Lord. I have a company, uh, uh, Fairport Yacht Support, which uh, provides uh, financial and uh, crew payroll for owners and also compliance with uh, ISM, ISP, SMLC, and PYC. Uh, and it's clearly, it's Norma's fault. <laughs> 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 you guys have to deal with me. I've, uh, I know it's been 25 or more years that I've been in the industry. I spent 10 years at sea as a chief engineer. Loved it, as uh, Norma said, the first boat that she got me on. The captain and I are still firm friends. Um, I have no 
bad experience or bad stories of my time on yachts. I absolutely loved it. Uh, that may, it, it certainly helps in my day-to-day -day work because I understand what's going on board, but I also struggle sometimes with uh, crew complaints because I think it's a great job. Um, and it'd be interesting to learn how we can make uh, it a more attractive job. Crew complaints. Um, uh -huh. There seems there seems to be a lot of, of complaining within the industry at the moment, right. and I think this is this is why I'm very interested in the subject. I want to hear from anybody that's willing to speak honestly and give us feedback because we want to do the best we possibly can. And so, well, we'll come back to you in a minute because I'll kick off with your. It's stuck in my head what you said. And to your right, my left, we have Mark Diekman. Correct, Mark Diekman. What, where, did we say where that was from? Well, originally it hails from Germany, more than Germany, but I'm American. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been a captain since day one again. I've uh, been captain uh, 22 years now. been in the industry, I got in the industry 33 years ago. Is it at CAM? Before I left it, went to college, came back to yachting. And you've been, you've had a lot, you've had, you've been in command of a lot of. Uh, I have. Graham was actually one of my vessel managers years ago. <laughs> it's amazing how small the industry is. None of this, by the way, was coordinated <laughs> between yeah. do you know somebody. Well, and I go back to, I, Norma doesn't remember me back from the 90s, because she's put crew on with me back in the late 90s. And what boat was that on? Uh, Morgan Star. Oh, of course, and absolutely. When you say that, you know, it's either, <laughs> you know, it's the peoples and the and the vessels that are that are equally important when you're talking about crew going on to a boat and retention. And one of the things that I've always found really important that that not all agencies have the time or the luxury today is to understand the operations of their of the boats and to try to best match um, the crew that want to go on board with their needs and their interests. So I think that's one of the issues is that. Um, with the sheer volume that is happening with the amount of crew around the world, over 50,000, um, that attention to knowing the, the captains, the boats, what they need, knowing the crew and their desires, if we can put them together a little more accurately, I think we would be able to help. And so um, that's one of the issues, you know, it, the volume has just gotten so large and there's so many players in it. So you just mentioned 50,000. I hear figures from 30 to 50, so. You know, it's like any other statistic. You know, if you, if, uh, the Yacht Report group calls a super yacht uh, anything above 34 meters. Boat International calls it anything above 24 meters. So depending on, on where you go. So you're right, uh, 30 to 50, it's more likely actually above that, to be honest with you, when you count the part-time people. And, mm. and of course, you know, the, the people that only do it part-time and, and so on, but uh, yeah, they were a 30 to 50 or more, sure, that's accurate. So the point of this um, series, Behind the Wrap, named Behind the Wrap, is because we want to give everybody in the industry an opportunity to see what else goes on in their industry. I was in a previous business, I won't go into it, um, it's one of the rules on the show, I don't talk about lights, so. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you from there though. I know. <laughs> and your father. <laughs> Yes, this is why we don't. But <laughs> I, was, I did that for 20 years, and I never really got a chance to see the rest of the industry, understand the struggles that as captains, what you go through, crew training. I, it, 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 as I've started doing this, it's become fascinating seeing how many different areas of the industry there are, how everyone is stuck in their own little bubbles, and everyone has their own... It's not... Yeah, persuasions and reasons for doing things. And the crew, from what you said, was it two weeks ago, is one of the main reasons that owners get out of the business or get out of their owning a boat. Yeah, so I make a point whenever I see an owner, ex-owner on the dock, they most of them like to come to the boat shows, ask him, why did you get out of the business? And the overwhelming answer is the crew politics, crew problems, through turnover. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think just going full circle for what we've really established today is this used to be a pretty tight industry. Uh, as, you know, I got my job through Norma, the boat, the first boat I was on, 15 years later I, I was managing. Uh, you know, so it all, it all goes around uh, and that held us together because there was a contact of, well, what do you know about this person, that person, you could just speak to each other. The industry has grown very quickly 
So some of that dynamics being lost. And I can tell you, when Norma had me interviewing for the job, she said, Graham, if you don't stay at this boat for a year, I don't care how miserable, how much you hate it, never come back in my office again. I, I remember that to this day, and I thought that was a very good line of commit to this job and commit for yeah. at least a year. Um, but I also think that too much is put on, it's the crew's fault. Quite frankly, I think it's the owner's fault. And I, I'll tell you why. Is I, I think, think it's equally both. I think that, and, I just, and, had, the, I just and, had this and happen. And the management and everybody else. I just had this happen a couple of days ago. The uh, owner was on board for a month in the med. A month is generally a long time. Great experience, everybody's happy. Boat is for sale, but not actively. The day after he gets home, he does a $5 million price reduction on the boat. What does that tell the crew that he's no longer interested? The day after leaving? It's not a very thoughtful thing to do. So, and these are the things that I... I that's I thoughtless, that's not... Well, that's much better way of putting it. So, I believe from an owner's perspective, the best things they could do for themselves is before they decide they want to sell a boat, is think about the structure of how this is going to affect other people's lives and come up with a selling campaign. Severance packages, how are we going to look after you? We're not just throwing you to one side. Because if that's the mindset from the owner, then that's the mindset from the crew. If you're just going to be discarded at my first whim, then the crew next time they get offered a job or right next door, well, the owner's going to do this to me, so I move on. So this is, this is where my mindset is. How do you make it a more serious decision about both entering into ownership and then, more importantly, how to exit ownership? This is the delicate balance, because a boat essentially is a business, mm -hmm. but it's also fun. So if you bring the element of business into... I'm sure, if, I'm sure they, these owners have got amazing businesses that they run like a clockwork, but the boat is, I would most of the time, not seen that way. And so treating it as... Which, in my opinion, is a bit bizarre. If you were... A few transactions I've been involved in of uh, yachting companies that have changed that I've worked with, keeping the staff has been the cornerstone of the deal. Yeah. And yet, in a yacht deal, it's, it's a nothing. It's odd to me. Well, you know, that, that's, that's a good point. Um, and everybody does have responsibilities in it. But the statistics about crew retention are scary indeed. Uh, the number one cost on any yacht um, in operation after it's been built is crew. Some people call them staff, but we know what they are, their crew, and they work very hard. The number one dissatisfaction item for owners is crew. We have, on average, over 50% turnover of, on yachts of the crew every single year. So it's really understandable why owners can be very disturbed by this. And yes, owners want their yachts to be their haven of peace and comfort and joy and safety for their families. Um, I helped write a book many years ago called Mega Yacht Wisdom with uh, two great captains, uh, Captain uh, Doug Hoogs and, and Buddy Hack. And um, one of the things that I wrote in the introduction was, um, this book is not for the faint of heart because it is going to tell you exactly what is the truth about what is involved in owning a yacht, and especially if you want to run it more successfully. But the reality is that owners can rely on industry professionals and their own businesses. If they set it up correctly, they can step away from those responsibilities, and the time that they should really be able to step away from it is when they're walking up the gangway. Well, and getting on the pass around. You know, both you and Graham touched on a couple things here that I see or I have seen is from the owner's side um, not giving enough direction on what, what, they're, what they want out of the boat. You know, because once the crew, if they have a good idea, all right, I'm going to buy this yacht. I'm going to have it roughly five years. I've got a five-year plan. We're going to have it. We're going to cruise these locations. If the crew have a true indication of where they're going to be based, yeah, given plans change in a split second, you're going to Alaska next minute, you're in Abu Dhabi. Um, some crew, they don't sign on for that. I think if you're very honest with the crew sure. about where, where the vessel's going and whether it's going to be private or charter, you match the crew to what the owner's wants and needs are. So if I have, if I want to have a boat that's going to be doing heavy charter, I'm going to want a crew that's charter friendly. Um, and it's going to be a family style charter, so I don't want crew that are only interested in white glove, white glove service. And tips. And tips. And there's other crew who are going to want to stay stationed more locally, Florida, Bahamas. Why hire them on 
as a captain, why would I want to hire someone like that that's going to be going to the Mediterranean? You got to match the personnel to the program. And if the owners would convey what that program is going to be, it's easier for us as captains or managers to say, hey, these are the type of crew that we need for this program. Well, you know, everything in life and in business is push and pull, right? Hmm. So um, I agree with you 100%. And one of the ways to really make that possible is to, and this is what I advise my clients now when I work with them on trying to establish their programs, and that is have crew manuals that you are very clear about the crew with. And one of the first captains I ever saw do that was A.J. Anderson, whose office we're sitting in right mm -hmm. now with Wright Maritime Group. His went from being That's, really long to being really this is thin. What, like an employee manual. Absolutely. This is how you, this is how we how do that. Abs some absolutely. McDonald's manual. And, um, I mean, some, Sorry, I'm cutting you off. No, it, but that's it, a great train of thought, actually. Um, and um, and the other thing is that um, what crew need to understand is that there is always going to be a certain amount of flexibility in the program, and all of that needs to be conveyed. So it comes back to um, really being clear about what the owner wants, as you said and also understanding that the crew need to know what their responsibilities okay. are and what is gonna be expected of them. But and you're gonna end up, I, th I think, with happier crew. And another point that you touched on that is super important, and this goes into motivation that I hope we're gonna be able to talk about a little bit. One of the things that is extremely demotivating on a yacht because it's, it's a really impersonal thing. You're working at somebody else's direction. You're eating the food they give you. You're wearing the clothes they give you. And you may or may not have time off to go celebrate, you know, your parents' silver anniversary or your sister's wedding or Christmas with your family or attend the birth of your child, depending on what situation you're in. So if crew understand many times what their regular schedule is and when they're going to get their time off and how they're going to be able to disconnect from the boat in order to accommodate those things, that can be something really important to add into the motivational pool, so to speak. Because I mean, I remember um, somebody saying, like, it's only just recently changed, but you used to be, a, there was no re regulation on how many hours you had to be on before you went off. And so you know, sometimes you'd be on for... Yeah, the MLC's corrected yeah, some yeah. of that on the larger vessels. <clears throat> and that's come in when? That was, when you, what was it? Um, 2000... In, in earnest, about four years ago. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Do you teach yeah. them this? Oh, yeah. Actually, I think it's maybe Mark's going through stuff right now. now. So it's not just so you're not really teaching them driving the boat. You're, you're teaching them, together. you know. In addition to that, the when Norma hit on the, the size of the industry now and the number of people that are in the industry now, it's it's a huge number. I mean, Thirty to fifty thousand people is a big number. Uh, we see between twelve and fourteen thousand students a year going through. So we how many? Twelve to thirteen. Twelve to fourteen thousand a year. Uh, now that's not just yachts. We do cruise ships, container ships, you know, deep draft, ocean tonnage. And that's uh, here, the only here location, location yeah, here. Yeah, here in Fort Lauderdale. So, that's bigger see, than most universities. Oh yeah, yeah, we're the largest in the world now. Yes. Yeah, and he's it's, one. It's a great little. I didn't realize. He's <laughs> one. He's one training facility, yeah. and there's yep. and there's it's, more of yep. them. Yep. So, but the the regulations with the explosive growth of, of the crew numbers, you know, vessel size has increased. You know, we see boats now with 60, 70 crew on, where before seven or eight was a big crew. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Southerly had what seven crew? No, uh, well. 12, yeah. 12, 12 to 14 total, band up, but, yeah. Yeah. but license would be yeah. seven. Seven, right. Yeah. yeah, we had 25. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you're seeing this explosive. So you look at <clears> Octopus <throat> now. She's got 66 crew on board. Uh, just amazing numbers of crew. So and at that I'm, point, it's not really a boat anymore, is oh, it? Oh, no, it's a ship. Yeah, that's yeah, why the ISM codes are coming in and all the, uh, all the standards that are coming in now for those vessels that are over 500 tons. And, you know, all the yachts now are getting just bigger and bigger and bigger which causes more and more problems because for Norma to place a crew on a yacht, she's got to place 12 to 15 or 20 people versus, you know, five or six. Well, and the yeah. owners are looking at a much bigger operation too. I mean, now it is truly a business and the mm -hmm. captain, uh, unfortunately, we've seen them, you guys know too, a huge change in a captain's job on a yacht. It was always as the manager, but now most captains spend most of their time managing and almost none of their time driving, which yeah. is a fun part of the job. Well, I, I think you know? a, a larger over overview of this with crew. A lot of crew don't see this as a career. Right. They see it as a job. Yep. A job means they're there for a season, they're there for two seasons. And as an owner, owner's got to realize that there's going to be a certain percentage of turnover no matter what. No matter you what. could pay them any amount of money they want, they're not going to stay. Yeah. 
So there's a certain amount of turnover you're going to have every year on board a vessel. Is that starting to change, though, the mentality? No. no. It's no. Not. You have in the, in the 22 year olds with a lot of money, right. they want to go they want to travel snowboarding and, and yep. skiing, and then they want to come back. So it's like working in a chalet, or it's. It's Probably exactly like working the chalet. It's the summer season, yeah. You've got two groups. You've got the licensed group, the captains, the engineers, the mates. Um, and the professional. The, the, the high-level department career. heads, uh, chief stews and all that, that are very high-level, and they are professional. They are, you know, they're doing it for a while. They've been in the business for a while. But the entry-level crew, and we talk to a lot of them when they're, uh, when they're coming to school, for their beginning courses, and we make sure that, that their head's in the right place, that they understand hmm. this is actually a job you're going to. This is a career that you're starting. This is a path you know, to work. It's an amazing career. It's fun. And it is an amazing career. It's something that, you know, we travel the world with it. You know, we've seen amazing places on really amazing, you know, vessels. And I worked on yachts and also on commercial stuff. And it was a great career to have. But like, you know, like we said, it's, it's a lot of the new ones coming in looking at it as a short term. I'll do a season or I'll do a year. I'll travel for free around mm -hmm. the world. I'll be on this beautiful yacht and meet all these exciting new people and make all kinds of money and have fun. And that's all true. But it's still work. But that's it's where still building a career for yourself. But that's also where I think I know on my side, people like myself and Graham have to educate an owner. You know that you have to expect a certain amount yeah. of turnover. You're not going to be able to keep all your people together all the time. Well, uh, no, absolutely not. But um, I definitely it, feel, and having been a business owner myself, that if you had 50% turnover in your business, you would be, you know, really worried about the health of your business mm -hmm. itself. And, um, you know, one of the things that I try to explain to entry-level crew, and um, Graham said, you know, I did it with him, and I still do it today when I'm speaking at conferences and going to maritime mm -hmm. colleges and universities, and even in today's world, junior high schools and high schools, to try to spread the word about how great yachting is. And the reality is that a lot of crew really don't understand that they can not only have great careers on board, long-term careers, that there's always a serious career progression. But look at the industry, the growth of the industry. All of us here, with the exception of our captain, have made the segue from on board to on land, and the growth of the yachting business and the opportunities mm -hmm. on land have grown even more so than the crew population. So we've created a brain drain in a way because we've taken some of the best and brightest and put them into land-based positions. And I don't see that changing. So well, we need to make sure that people know that there are many long-term, decade-long careers. I spent my whole life in it, and I tell you, I cannot imagine anything better because the yachting industry continues to grow. So the opportunities in it continue to grow mm. aboard and ashore. I mean, I was, somebody, a, a crew agent, once told me the cycle of a crew's life, and it's very sad. So they, you know... Young, 22-year-olds, they start on a boat, they fall in love, he's the captain, she's the stew, and they have a great five, six years together. Then eventually she gets pregnant and um, she wants to go ashore. And so he tries to keep the job. This is probably... <laughs> that shouldn't be saying. <laughs> he keeps the job on the boat, she gets annoyed that she's, he's never there, so then he comes on, on, on shore. He then tries to find a career that he can do on land. So he believes he can start a management company or he can start a whatever it is that he feels Become he's broker, got good whatever at. Whatever it might be, yeah. That falls apart. They get start getting into arguments. He goes, I'm going back to boats. And then he's back on a boat. Eventually, he gets hooked up with the next stewardess, and then it's all a mess. And this is the cycle, which apparently is Well, continuing. you know, I would like to have a meeting with that crew agent and really... <laughs> talk to them about the messaging that they're giving, because if that is the mentality of a crew agent, imagine no, the no, mentality no, no, no. of the people no, that no, they're No, no, this, this is the dark, dirty secret of what actually happens. I'm not sure that I agree. I'm not sure that I agree with that. And again, if anybody is buying into that kind of a theory, then they themselves have a mentality that is sending that message across, especially to potential brand new crew. And, and that's not really a healthy thing. No, but if that is what's happening, well, I think that's... There's a certain percentage of yeah. that, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, besides the fact that that's generalizing and kind of sexist <laughs> and so on, um, I'm not sure that that's, that's a major statistical you do reality. Have, you do have crew that stay the course. You know, and that, that's something else, too. I mean, uh, I've got a friend of mine that has started sailing on a yacht as a deckhand, and she is now sailing on the same yacht 22 years later as the captain. See, this so is what I've never heard. Yeah. It's an amazing success story. 
you know, you look at those other yachts that, that are family owned with a crew on for 14, 15, 16 years. You know, they stay with that one family on that one mm -hmm. boat. They find that home. They find that, as you mentioned, that fit. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about mm -hmm. talking to the owners and making sure that you fit the right crew with the right owners. When that happens, it's magic. Well, I, the crew never leaves. The crew are happy. The owners are happy. You have this incredible experience where the owner loves, loves the boat, which helps us, right? Because he's going to stay mm -hmm. in yachting. Mm -hmm. You have a crew that stays there, so your retention rates go way up. Everyone is just happy. It's when the crew are jumping from boat to boat to boat that you see this massive turnover, this upset owner, the owner saying, enough, yachting's not fun for me. If I, let me just no. put in one thing here on a two part to this. First part, owner gets a vessel. The best thing I, I would always recommend to any, any owner, even before you buy the boat, get the best captain you can, get someone who's gonna be a manager, a leader, someone that you truly trust 100%. And, Empower them like you'd empower a CEO of a business. Yeah. Treat you them. Are treat the CEO of a business. Right, and then let them let them run the staff. Try to stay out of it. Let the vessel manager and captain run the crew. You show up, just have fun, enjoy the boat. Don't try to get involved in the day-to-day -day politics. Stay out of it. You'll enjoy that more. On the crew side coming up, it's you know if the crew were to treat it a little bit more professional, the captain also including the crew in some of the, not the decision making of operational boat, but how the boat is run and why we do certain things. Because a lot of the green crew, they don't understand why we do the things we do on board. Because uh, they just don't have the experience. And they, you know, they want to run before they can walk. You know, or, or run before they can even crawl in the maritime oh. world. And it's up to, you know, if we had more of the officers mentor the junior crew and slow them down. You know, you got to pull the reins in on them. Slow down and learn it in steps. Just take slow steps. You don't have to go from deckhand to captain in two years. You're not going to learn enough information. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get burnt out. And when you advance too quickly, you end up getting yourself fired for incompetence yeah. because Absolutely. you, you want to move, you move too far forward. And I think a, a good captain or owner or manager or officers will hold some of those crew back. I know the crew aren't going to want to hear me say that. But if they slow down and master the skills step by step, and you'll succeed. You know, I've had a long, slow, steady career. Graham came up through the ranks, started his own business, and he's grown it. I've watched him go from where he was to where he is now. But I think if you do everything in a methodical way and nice and slow, the crew win and the owners win by having the crew grow with them slowly and steadily. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it all goes back to having a properly organized program. You know, there's a lot of blame laid in the yachting world about, you know, who it is that's setting up these unreal expectations. You know, we all know it's easy to say, you know, that yacht broker, when they sold the boat, you know, told them they can run it with half the crew they need and half the price they need. That may well be true. Um, but also, if any time that you're buying an asset of a, of a certain value, if you're doing it for your business or even if you're buying a home, you're probably going to do a little bit of homework as well. So, uh, you know, there's, there's responsibility on all sides. Um, a lot of people talk about, you know, we have training schools for the crew and we have great captains that do motivation with their crew training, bring them up right. You know, we have a certain percentage of, you know, uniform captains, you know, that pass the training classes and look good and are put in charge of a command of a vessel. And I don't think that's a really huge part of it either. Um, but a lot of people have talked about, and I think it's something that would really help, you know, as I said, when, mm -hmm. when we wrote Beggy Out Wisdom many years ago, we sold it out twice. And every single owner that ever read it, many of them have said to me, that's become my Bible. Well, that book, mm -hmm. book needs updating because that was before ISM and everything MLC. else. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, mm -hmm with many people, um, helping the owners, you know, owner training school. I don't know, is that possible? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a population it's a that doesn't idea. like to be lectured to, that's for sure. Yeah. No. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good idea, but it's not gonna work. I don't, I don't believe that there's any bad people per se. I think that there's people that uh, are not in the right situation and simply right. leaving a boat or, or changing a captain yeah. or changing a that's management company or, yeah. or selling, selling the boat is not the solution. It's finding a, a better combination of way to do things. What, what we've just started up, and I'll be announcing this at the Monaco show, is we're, we are now taking on the burden of being the employer. Uh, and uh, the, the reason I'm doing this is that 
once we start to build initially a core of our licensed crew, because in my mind I do differentiate. You've got the licensed crew who have invested money in, in yeah. their career, and you've got the, the crew that are in a nomadic phase and still trying to find their way in. And, and in terms of what, what, what position do you need to start so, getting a license? Well, I, I think that it's you're looking probably after about one and a half years, two years of being on board and going, I'm, I'm ready to commit to this, or you know what, I've always wanted to climb the Andes and I'm, I'm off. Um, so that's, and that's, people are going to make that decision. The, the concept we have, though, is that by being the employer, we will ask for a budget for the crew, and that budget will cover it. How we split up holiday time, vacation, bonuses, and all that is really nothing for the owner to worry about as long as they've accepted and we were within budget. That gives us the freedom to start putting in rotation where we think rotation is right, to do training where we think training is right. And more importantly, to go to a captain and say, you're not the right fit for this boat. But don't worry, go home. We're going to call you in six weeks and we're going to move you to another boat, but you're going to be paid for the duration. Uh, and being able to give people a real um, confidence that just because it's not a right fit, you don't have to quit. You don't know, and go through the whole rigmarole that you can, you're in a safe family, if you will, and we just find the right, the right so you're on a, You're on a major key right there. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. I can tell you it's been legally extremely difficult. There's uh, a lot of people who the, don't. And it's a real, it's a real challenge. Legally and, why? Because uh, you're an employer well, now. No, I have. I mean, right. we've, this has been in existence now for six weeks and we have 56 crew already that I employ. I, I, never, I don't want to employ <laughs> that many people and I think it's going to turn into the thousands. Um, so there's a lot of legalities, and it's really not that financially lucrative, to be quite honest with you. So these are the, but it's the only way I can see that we can overcome this reoccurring problem of people leaving because leaving's not the answer, and um, the fear that other boats for sale, I got to get out of here. Uh, and so those are the two. I, I believe that senior crew, once they have licensing, yeah. most likely have a mortgage or some some real overhead they've got they bills. need to know they've got <laughs> yes. bills there we Family. go uh, that they need to know that there's a paycheck there every month they're well not, you know that's, that's a really good point that you're bringing up and i really wish that more um businesses and you know there's so many multiple yacht fleets out there that owns the yachts owners own more than one boat and mm -hmm. th that touches on another one of the things that's really difficult and really impacts um our lack of crew retention and that is the fear out there in the crew community that they don't have a steady job progression, that they know that once they're off that boat, they might have to leave in order to get their training. They have to pay for yep. their training themselves. They don't know how long it's going to take them to get another job. And all of the uncertainties which plays on your mind and the financial worries. Um, so if they know that they have a more steady job progression mm. and they're not going to go through these gaps of six months or a year where they're unemployed mm. and have to pay for themselves, I think that is a tremendous motivational factor and something that if it works with you and some of the other programs that have instituted similar things, including things like centralized payroll and on and on and on, yeah. I think that's, that's a, and that's, that makes us more serious as a business too. So congratulations on that, Graham. Well, they're, they're yes. working at that point. You know, they have a, a career, they're, they're working for you. Well, well both they're on sort of changes, but they're, they're getting the same paycheck at the same time, the same progression. They see this pathway of success, this pathway there a, of success. standardized pay, pay there, There's pay levels, no. but there's nothing standardized. Standardized no, is not, no never going to work. Um, but yes. they have that will not job. work. You have some range, but yeah. you know, it's, uh, a lot of boats pay a lot more than others, and a lot of boats, depending on, you know, charter boat or private boat's going to change. And that's an expectation it, it, too, I think. The an itinerary, has, how far you're away from home. How long you're away from home. Away from home, how, yep. how busy you're running. There's so much that goes into it. And pay is just one piece of a compensation Absolutely. package. Yes. Uh, I believe in rotation. Yeah. I believe in good medical benefits. I'd love to see a, a proper pension scheme in this industry. Mm -hmm. and we, will, we will do that next. Um, it's ridiculous that we don't have these things. These, yeah. you know, this is, so this is changing from a cottage industry to a, to a, a real industry. Business, and real I think industry. that's these are a lot of the growth pains that it's we've just seen. Pay, yeah. well, we see a lot of guys that will, guys and girls, I use that term collectively here, uh, a lot of folks that leave yachting to go to the commercial side. Because the commercial side of the business, you know, the, the deep draft uh, tankers, tugs, container ships, cruise ships, all those, mm -hmm. they have a rotation. <laughs> well, I, I left yachts and I went to work on tankers which was great because oil never complained. 
<laughs> one complaint from the oil. Uh, but you worked three months on, and I had three months off. And my pay stayed the same throughout. And I, you know, I'd worked six months out of the year, and the other six months out of the year, I was doing other things. I was, you know, traveling. I was working on, you know, doing deliveries. I was getting education. I was getting all that stuff. It's... But I knew at day X, I went back to work. I <laughs> went back to the boat. And whether it was this ship or this ship or that ship, I was going back to a ship because the management company I worked for, same thing. You know, in the commercial side, they had a variety of vessels they'd place you on. Yeah, but you're only taking rotate. care of that ship. Right. You're not running a hospitality, exactly. ho hotel, restaurant, exactly. resort. Which I think brings up the need for rotation even more so. Because if you look at the, the work burden on yachts, is, is pretty high. Not just the daily work of taking care of the vessel and keeping it in pristine condition, mm -hmm. but also servicing the hospitality side, keeping the mm -hmm. owners happy, the guests happy, the kids happy, making sure, as a chef, that you're satisfying everyone's particular cuisine desires. See, and I, that you are dealing, I, you are living with people in very small, very short tight, yep. quarters, and you have to be able to figure out how you have enough personal space right. to, to work yeah. within the crew dynamics. That's really difficult. I, I agree with what, what y'all are saying, but when you're dealing with a charter boat, charter clients, even some owners, they like to have their certain people around them. They like that right. certain personality. They, they want that person. They want, they want to have that continuity yeah. of service. When they wake up in the morning, they know exactly who they're saying good morning to, yeah. who they're saying good night to. Well, and there's they, a couple they're of expecting, and, and they, they do want that service. And as a yacht crew member, even myself, who's been doing this for many yeah. decades now, there's a certain amount of self-sacrifice you have to do if you want to be in this industry for a certain amount of time. Um, Mark, I think that there's and a balance there, though. There, that there if, does have balance. In life, if you and, want the same person oh, serving you at a table every night in a restaurant, you would expect to tip that person more. Yes. I think that if that is what your needs are, then understand that that person's position is going to be outside of the industry yeah. standard cost. Yeah. Because then Same. what we do is we supplement. Yeah, that don't get me wrong. Knows, I'm all for the rotation. That, that I would love to have That person knows for sure <laughs> that they will never do another Atlantic crossing unless they want to. They don't have to be there for the shipyard periods. They don't have, like and we will, supplement, <laughs> we will supplement their absence by funding from the owner who says, okay, I know I can get a cheap stewardess for 80000 but I want that cheap stewardess. All right, boss, that position now costs 100000 because I need to find a way to supplement and give that person real time off. And this is, this is what we're working on. The same mm -hmm. when a boat comes for sale. My belief is when a boat comes for sale, the owner should, the, the, the seller, it should be a conversation, and I've done this many times successfully, say, I want you from day one to give me a, um, uh, a, a fund that I can, I know at the end of the day we can pay the crew. So I can go to the crew and say, boat's up for sale. We have, we've set up this unemployment fund. If you stay with the boat, you're going to get X, Y, Z. Uh, right. You're motivated to be part of the sales process. And I found it very easy to, to, to speak to owners about this because I've been there. Crew I know, a as a chief engineer that sold them two boats, I, I could have destroyed, I could have destroyed that deal. Right. And if the yeah. owners hadn't come to me and mm -hmm. shown that you know, they were going they were, they were to take care of me, I was motivated to be part of the sale of that boat. Oh. And these are things that You're I think that we can do right. in a far more yeah. structured way that that, that money would go towards that unemployment fund and all these things to, to make sure that it's not, not, not just you as a chief figure on the boat, not you, person X, <laughs> um, got paid the lump sum, that the lump sum was actually distributed in a more managed way, not the impression of what a broker or a, or a owner thought happened in that transaction. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, let's so there is money out there to do this. It's just... If the owners... If the owners understand the value to them of doing that, and the reality is, uh, we all know that um, you know owners use their yachts generally less than a dozen weeks out of the year. If you charter, unless you're doing the heaviest charter program in the entire world, you're probably only going to charter 15 weeks out of the year. So there should be a way to figure out if if the owner absolutely has to have that chief stewardess, that chef, that bosun. That engineer, I don't know what the positions are that they might want. You should be able to rotate those out so that they have that face that they want and then be able to bring in the other people. And one of the things that's scary, though, about rotation is that because of the crew turnover, it's, it's natural that owners, rotation, if you do it right, is not going to cost you only 20% extra on top of your bonus. 
it should, in rightfulness, and going back to your point, Ted, it should cost you 200% because you need to pay those people when they're off the boat mm -hmm. it, or pay them 50% of what they would normally make. But you need to organize those things and it's really doable, you know, if you think about it in advance and it's not a, a knee-jerk reaction. And, you know, there is only a certain amount of time and effort and, and heartfelt friendliness and hospitality that any of us have. And if you're working, you know, face forward with, with people and know that you have to be there 50 weeks a year, that may be something that's difficult because, again, it's not just the eight hours a day that you're working, if you're lucky, but it's also the amount of time that you have to spend with all those other people working under somebody else's complete environment and control, which unfortunately is really dehumanizing. Well, this goes, what you're saying, this goes back to what a couple of you were saying, actually I think all three of you were saying, is if you're gonna have any kind of rotation or even get crew off when the owner's not there, bring on some different charter crew, you have to have a very well organized, managed vessel. Yeah, right. absolutely. So that all the crew members, they show up, they know exactly what their details are, whether from the captain down to the deck camp, that there's a procedure on how everything's done on board. So that you're not so from one crew to another department crew, everyone knows this is the way it's run on the board this boat. Absolutely. So you can jump from boat A to yeah. boat C to boat F. This is the way it's run through all the boats, through the whole fleet. Um, that way the owner and the other crew have a very good idea when I'm getting a new second engineer on board to help me from another boat. He knows the paperwork, he knows the computer system, he knows the policies and procedures that the master of this boat is gonna enforce on me. Much less the parts and the inventory. It's, it's gotta be across, yeah. it's gotta be with, across the with line. What we do, that honestly is the hardest part because putting the procedures and all that are quite easy. Getting people to follow them becomes the harder part. <laughs> and and you know, the, irony, the, the irony is that Human resources. I'm doing this yeah. to provide you continuity and really that, well, we did it this way on the last boat. That's fantastic. And if it's better, we'll change the whole fleet. But if it's just because that's what you did before, that's why you left. Yeah. We're doing yeah. it a little bit differently here. So, you know, open your mind to a slightly different way of doing things. And that is a hard, a hard sell. And I'm, I'm not expecting this to, you know, happen within even the next five years. But it, it has to be that way. So at least when you're getting on board the vessel, uh, the mundane things, your accounting and your checklists and your, your crew agreement and all that stuff, you've seen that a hundred times. You don't have to learn mm -hmm. that. You just have to learn how this machine works or, or how this guest like things. That's mm -hmm. all that you're learning is the nuances, not the actual yes. whole job all the time. Well, no. you know, Mark, you brought up a, a a acronym, HR, Human Resources, that is something that I continue to scratch my head about. Um, depending on what country you live in, let's say if you live in Germany, any business that has over 10 people has to have somebody that specializes in HR, even if it's a certain amount of time. And when you get into larger businesses, certainly with the very largest of crew that have 50, 60, 70, 80 crew members on board, I am, continue to be surprised why we have not seen a growth of dedicated, trained HR managers on board the yachts because it is a complicated thing to figure out the, you know, the, the switching over of the crew, the vacation time, the benefits, all of those things that are so important. And I, I keep waiting to hear of the first yacht that actually has a dedicated HR manager maybe not even ashore, ashore is already a good thing, but if they're on board for the very largest of yachts. We, we did it. Fantastic. I'm, my last boat, I'm not gonna say a name, but we did our own payroll on board. We did all the own benefits on board, time off, scheduling the flights, and it was not an easy task. Did you have a person dedicated, dedicated to that per, A purser, yep, per dedicated purser. for 100% of the vessel's business. It is. It's a very, and what, what happened last, it's, last month or last year may not be relevant. And I, I can only draw my own experience. I love being at sea. I still do to yeah. this day. I love doing Atlantic crossings. But when my first son was born, sitting for three weeks doing Atlantic crossing when I could have been home with them was soul destroying. Yeah. I changed. I get that. I accept that. But people change. And that's, you know, well, having, having HR that can accommodate that is a very important You see part. a lot of the boats going to a blue and gold crew. 
you know, or, or an A and B crew, mm -hmm. call it. Right. So they have the same people, but they're rotating back and forth. Right. And there's a little bit of that give, you know, hey, you've got a, you know, a son being born or, you know, your, your parents' silver anniversary, uh, anything like that. They, they work through those things. Do they get paid half the amount? And a lot of boats depends. There's, I, I there's can, consistent payroll ways. That sounds a great idea. Uh, I, can, I can answer that because it, this is something I've spent a lot of time on. <laughs> I pay it. Um, on the average 12-month salary, if you take a month's holiday as the industry standard, to go from a full salary, uh, and this is towards an owner at least, the cost to an owner moves from the equivalent of a 12-month salary to between 16 and 17 months salary. And that employs two people on rotation. Um, and that, so you, you, you're looking at between 70 and 80% of your full salary, but you're, you're working 50% of the time, right. so it's a balance. Um, and as long as your flights are kept sensible, and this is where you need a sensible crew that know that Rotation if I fly out of here today, it's $700, but if I wait two days and fly out of there, it's 150 Let's let's postpone, postpone the rotation for today. Or if I know that two months my vacation is coming up, maybe you can really get a reasonable price. Well, all of these pieces, exactly, all of these pieces. So it works out, the, the additional cost to the owner is the equivalent of, of four to five months of salary on each position. It's not double, and that's where most people start with. It's going to cost me twice as much. It really doesn't work out that way. And that's not taking the hiddens. Crew placement because of more turnover, all right. these things, and it's right. just, I think another study that would be well, and the fabulous. time it takes to get that person up to well, speed. How much really? does it cost to change yeah. out a stewardess? How much yeah. does it really cost? Not right. you know, it's okay, monetary, it's, it's, it's time, time experience, money. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> the time takes just to get there. I know on a full ISM boat like you, mm -hmm. you've been on, Mark, a new crew member on the first day, the first officer is going to spend his entire day. her entire day. With that person, yes. What is the actual cost Vessel of that? familiarization. Yes. I would say that it's, it's per crew that. member. You're looking. If you look at really, what is it actually costing? It's probably about twenty thousand dollars per each change of crew yeah. member. If you presented minimum. it, a minimum. And yes. that's a crew yeah, for, That's for, a junior crew member. That's for yeah. one to leave and one to come. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. It, yeah. because you know people. A lot of people say, oh, the agency fees and everything. But the reality is, agency fees are a drop in the bucket. Crew uniforms are a drop in the bucket. Flying them in is a drop in the bucket. What's really important is the, loss the of lack knowledge. of knowledge of the boat itself yep. and the mm -hmm. lack of knowledge of what those owners want to do. And those are intangibles, but that's, that's what the true cost is. And the lack of owner confidence, as you said, if they're not seeing the people that they want and they like, and especially if then they find out that you know, the new chef doesn't know that their doesn't child has an but, allergy right, or exactly. whatever it might be. Let, yeah. let me throw one other thing out there. Um, from a crew standpoint, for helping owners, you know, with some of the costs and the, and the crew turnover, um, you know, as a, as a captain, one of the things that I found helpful to do after I saw a certain amount of turnover in a, in a couple of departments, because I let my department heads hire the crew, they know what the How parameters many crew did you are. Have? Uh, we had 25. Right. So you have to empower your department heads. And one of the things I found is, Early on is I had a couple department heads that were turning over quite a bit of crew for what I thought were very low reasons. Uh, but you have to empower them and teach them and bring them along the ways. And it wasn't until I started demonstrating or showing these two department heads on what it actually cost the owner, right. the money-wise, and then how much time, as you said, the chief officer has to spend you know, with indoctrination of the paper and the purse work the paperwork. What it cost to change out a crew member for some infractions that, yeah, you, someone should be discharged for, but is it smarter to discharge a crew member or is it better to try to save that person, you know, spend the time with them, educate them about what they did wrong and bring them up? A little mentoring. Mentoring, and then they become even more valuable and loyal to you, and you save the owner, that you save the turnover, and you've also saved the lack of knowledge that you're losing from the boat. Um, and I think having some crew members, especially department heads who are coming up the up and coming ranks, learn the financial implications of their actions, you know, when they change out the crew on board. You know, they just see it's oh I change out a crew member, I fill a few forms and yeah, bloody da, it's all done. Shows up. It's all done. Yeah. But well, they don't they, 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 but they don't see anyway. the bigger picture of sure. what that does to the whole you know, the whole it's program. There's there's a lot of we talk about the, the growth in the business and growth in the industry. There's a growth in regulations too now. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing, I mean, tremendous growth in that. A lot. And the international community has broken that into operational level training and management level training. And in management level training for the captains, the engineers, the department heads, really gets into a lot more of that kind of minutia. 
that gets into the intangibles to the rest of the crew. You know, they don't understand, you know, the human factors. You know, what are mm -hmm. the things that affect the crew other than just, you know, well, I don't like him, so I'm going to get rid of him. Well, no, let's, let's go a little bit beyond that. And the personality changes. It's huge. You know, we're buying and selling experiences, right? When a person buys a yacht, they're buying an idea. They're buying an experience. They're buying something that they want to have fun on. Most of our They're buying an emotion. Yeah, exactly. They're buying an emotion. And what's that emotion? That emotion is, ah. Yes. You know, they're all type A people. Mm. They're all very successful people. They all live very stressful lives. I can't think of a single owner I worked for that was, you know, carefree and, <laughs> and, and laissez-faire about life. No, they were targeted. They were aggressive. They were focused. You know, on the yacht, they want to take a break from that. They want to have that relief. You know, it's our job to sell them that experience. Sure. You know, when back they walk you, up the gangway, they should be able to exactly. check their brains yep. and check in their heart. And they shouldn't be involved in, like you talked about earlier, you know, when, when that owner shows up, that's, that's fun time for him. Maybe back at the office, he's got questions for the captain about crew and staffing and itineraries and all that. When he shows up to the boat, it's time to have fun. Yeah, it's crew, time for crew the crew to be work. An, an ambassador is a good health exactly. and fun and happiness. Yep. They, and that's where the crew retention comes in, too, because if they have an owner that understands that, if they have a, a captain that understands that, and a management company that understands that, and a placement company that understands that, you know, it's all these factors all come into this crew retention idea. The right crew, the right owner, the right managers, the right captains, all of that works together to make this experience. Because we're not just selling the experience to the owner. We're selling it to our crew. If the crew have a bad experience, what's the number one reason crew leave? They don't like their job. They don't right. like the boat, right? They probably so they don't understand their job and all the things right. we've been discussing. Yep. You know, I'd like to bring up one other subject, and this is um, related to the fact that we're an international business. Um, we're all here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, um, and, you know, we have several nationalities just right here, and that's really representative of the yachting industry. Um, the ownership population of yachts is similar, mm -hmm. um, but it is definitely true that <laughs> statistically speaking, by far the majority, the largest percentage of yacht ownership um, is American. And because due to recent changes in laws, it's going to be possible for American yacht owners, and that population is climbing back up every single year, yep. those Americans are going to be able to now flag their yachts US. in the United yeah. States. And I think we all agree, we haven't even discussed it, but I bet we all agree that one of the things that we definitely don't have enough of is American crew. And that is going to be something that could be extremely crucial and turn around and bite us all where it hurts if we can't figure out a way to solve that. And, you know, there's a lot of issues involved in it. A lot of American crew feel like they've been discriminated against because of insurance companies and, and flag mm -hmm. state regulations and so on. You know, I, I refuse to believe that Americans are inherently less able and willing to be successful yacht crew. But we need... <laughs> We great example going, of a great American captain there right there. Go. Oh, but there's a lot of great ones out there. There are American many, but not enough. There. No. no. When you try to find American crew right now, it is such a major issue. I've got an owner that owns a whole bunch of yachts, one of my biggest clients. And he himself, he's got over 60 crew within his fleet. And most of his boats are American flag. And I'm telling you, trying it's to tough. find the American crew. And this is just one owner. And as I said, the statistics on the growth of Americans as yacht owner, owners is growing, and how many of those are going to start flagging their boats U.S. because now they can? So this is yet a, this is a mm. sideline. We've had so many interesting issues, but that's one of them that is is serious. Well, you're talking about how people come into the industry, which is one topic we've touched on a little bit. How do we keep them? Well, I think the entry in is important. It's, is it? it's very important. I have never met. This is a huge sweeping statement, but I'm going to stick to it. Uh -oh. Go for it. Here I have go. never met a crew member that intentionally got into yachting. That's it. That somebody came to my high school when I was 15 years old, and they gave us a, a pre <laughs> presentation. I thought, I want to learn more. I want to do this. Not one, which is bizarre when you think about our clientele. Right. That everybody's just kind of stumbled into working for these mavericks in business. It makes no sense whatsoever. Well, I also found this, this is one of the reasons I started the 20 S's, is we were sitting at the Miami Boat Show two and a half years ago talking with friends who had fallen into the industry. And through my experience, it is that you happen upon this. But they really knew what they were doing. Well, that's, a big, that's a big problem, though. With the, especially with the crew when they first come in, just like Graham was saying and you're starting to say. They come in with this grandiose idea of what yachting is. 
they don't they really realize no they don't realize <laughs> that you're going to be sacrificing family holidays, personal space, personal space, relationships, emotional stability. You're, there's <laughs> there's a does. lot. I've it's, seen a lot of crew have, have breakdowns on board because they don't know what's going on back home. It's or a tremendous they get a sacrifice. Dear John or a dear Jane letter. You know, I mean, it, it's it's earth shattering. Have you ever considered putting an MPT up in Ohio? Get some of that Midwestern <laughs> mentality into or, your... Or Wisconsin well, or California yeah, or let me, New York. Let me explain or, to you yeah. our model, uh, and I'll tell you why our model works for us. Um, I'm a type A personality, you know, in case you didn't figure that out. Whole family I like is, to be right? in charge. The whole family is. <laughs> uh, my father started the business 35 years ago with a very simple premise, which was to make the Mariner better. That was his whole premise. He was a chief engineer and a, and a master in limited, so he had a lot of experience in industry, both on yachts and commercial. And he knew... We can do it better than this. We, we, as an industry, can do it better than this. So that's always been our ethos since the very beginning was to make them better. We draw from Ohio. You know, we draw. Right now, I, I, I checked before I came over here. We have 27 different nationalities on campus right now. So How many only, of them are Filipinos? Um, well, that'd be one nationality. That'd be one. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Depends. You know, we have a, a large contingent of cruise ship training that we do. Uh, we're the primary yeah. training provider for a lot of the cruise ship companies. So for the cruise ships... That mix is going to change. You're seeing more and more Filipinos in yachting now, especially on the larger, you know, very large yachts. You're seeing Filipino deck crews and, and a, lot of, a lot of Filipino crews coming in. Um, and it's a huge source of crew globally. You know, it's one of the largest providers of maritime labor is the Philippines. Mm. It's huge. Because uh, they're good at it. They're good at it. Well, you know, and to what we were talking about earlier, Mark, with, uh, with regards to Americans and your point about American crew and American vessels, the average American teenager coming out of high school right now is not thinking hey, I want to go to yachts. Hey, I want to work. I want to clean toilets for a living for the next three years. Or I want to squeegee a boat for the next three years. I guess I, I was that. one of the few then. Yeah. <laughs> I was one of the first one at 17. <laughs> I wanted to travel. You know, I, I started work. My first job at 15, I was working on a 58-foot Hatteras yacht fish between here and the Bahamas. And I worked on it all summers. And the owner hired me on weekends when I was still going to school. Uh, I got a job on a 107-foot yacht doing a delivery when I was 16. That was Fantastic. Huge boat back then. Well, yeah, and we did a transatlantic with it. So I was right. like, oh, this is great, you know? Um, but a lot of the people coming out now, a lot of the kids today, aren't being raised in that service-oriented field. And this is a service field, let's face it. Mm. You know, we as crew, we're serving the owners. We're working mm. on the vessel. We're there to ensure that their experience is yeah. one of the stellar. Is so, six it is, service. isn't it? Yeah. You are basically in it's, service. We are six-star service. It's, it, it's a so, hospitality yeah. industry. Yeah. And what I was but saying it, before with... The new wow, crew coming. Out my head, because I haven't really ever. Yeah, but yeah, it it's is. a it's a no, hotel. It's, it's, it's a resort. It's a it's a it's a, a, a movable resort. Yep. Yep. Well, you and know, we've talked about so many things here. We we started out talking about retention of crew, and I think we've touched on a lot of ways that that can be improved. I think certainly from an operational point of view, if you empower your heads of department and give them mm -hmm. um, the knowledge and the tools in order to be able to do their job. If you have businesses like. Grams that are coming up with new concepts about how to manage the crew to make it a better, steadier job for them if they're getting great training and so on. Um, I certainly have met crew people that have heard me speak about yachting careers and have come into the industry. Yeah. And one of the most gratifying things in my life, to be honest with you, is when I have people that come up to me and say, when I met you 20 years ago, I never knew what my life was going to turn out to be like. And thanks to you, yeah. I've been in it for you all changed, this time. You changed my life. I exactly. So yeah. as an industry, one of our big responsibilities is not just educating the owners and working with everybody else, but as an industry, and we've been talking about this a long time ago, we need to all be involved in recruitment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jane Buffington yeah. used to be great about that, the yes, famous lady who said... Nobody needs to own a yacht. They have to want to own a yacht. That's right. And she used to also do something, and she used to challenge a lot of us that were friends of hers. She used to say, I challenge each and every one of you, every time you go to a great restaurant, if you go to a beach club, if you go to a hotel, and you meet people that have that, that shining, outgoing, genuine personality yep. and have the right kind of, you know, physical strength to be able to do the job. I challenge you to talk to them yep. about what the yachting industry Introduce is them like to yachting. and bring them in. Yep. So we can do that as individuals, but I do think as an industry, we need to pay attention to this subject because again, it's the number one um, cost of operation of a yacht. It's the number one owner problem. Okay. There's, yep. there's two issues with what, what you're saying. It goes to what you're saying. 
and I think we've all come across it, is, as you were saying, it's the education side of the owner and the crew, not the technical education, the education of what it is that we're doing. Right. Definitely. And if the crew have a true idea of what it is that they're getting themselves into. Eyes wide open when they come in. And to know the, the truth. I mean, oh, yeah. not, not just is that not, a good thing, not, not the varnish stuff. Yes, it is if you want retention. If you want to keep them, yeah. But you People gotta, like come in with this idea, but this the, the you, romantic notion, don't stay in yachting. In yeah, the below dicks version. Yeah, they don't know. Oh, don't even it's say gotta that. be. <laughs> Shall we go there? No, no, no not yes. yet. Hold on, hold on one second. <laughs> so, so the crew have to have okay. a true idea of what they're getting into. Yes. The unvarnished bit of it. The so crew need to know. And owners, owners need to, need to yep. have a true view of what they're getting into in yachting, also, to understand the ins and outs. And that's all our responsibilities. From, oh, yeah. Like you said, the brokers from, down to the yeah. boat builders to the, everybody. If the, the owners want no this, doubt. this everybody. highest experience that they all want to have in this yacht, this ah moment. Do they right? all want that? I yes, they, they do. do. Yeah, they all I think want they to have do. that sure. break. They all want to take it's that time and go right, and get away from the stress. But it's it's how you match the two. The crew the and the people. owner, you, they have to be matched. Yep. And there's a lot of people that are in between it. Um, uh, you did say below deck. Can I say something about that? Well, we are out of time, so if everyone's okay, we can either <laughs> go for this or and listen, we can it's, end it's, it here. It's an extremely controversial subject, and, and I just want to be upfront and tell you that um, I've done some work for the production team at Below Deck, helping them find locations and so on. Um, in France and Italy and some resources and so on. One of my dearest friends in the world um, who I've been to sea with and I've worked with a lot, Captain Sandy Yawn. She's one of the best captains ever. She is the captain in Below Deck Med and she has grown it to be the most popular show on Bravo. Something like 20 million people tune in for every single episode. And that's another thing I think we need some education about. And that is, it's just like yachting careers. Mm -hmm. It's good and bad. Right. Um, you, you get a flavor of what it's like on a yacht, but let's face it, it's skewed towards, towards some That's of the terrific. negative aspects. And what Sandy says is that in her very long career, and again, I want to say she's the most awesome captain and manager been? of people. Excuse she's, me? Been, she's been a captain for decades. Been, oh yeah, she's been a captain for I she think 30 years now. She was I managed to. Yeah, yeah she started years 15 ago. years ago. I've been to sea with her, I'm telling you, you've never seen a better boat mm. handler or mm person to deal with than Sandy. She's limited in what she can do. Um, and I wish that the producers of Below Deck would listen to us a little bit better. But again, it's good and bad. It introduces people to the concept of yachting. Um, and Sandy says, and it's very true, that every single thing that happens on the show, the over-dramatized show, has happened at one point or another on one yacht that she's been on. It just doesn't happen every, every single every week single with every single oh, guest, yeah. and nor is it encouraged by, it's not encouraged by Sandy on this boat either. It's not encouraged by the management. It's not encouraged by the operators, and there's very few owners that you know really want to take crew people out and throw alcohol down their throats to see how much trouble they can get themselves into. And we have reached out to the producers of Below Deck, and it's been again another push and pull we have we have said to them hey you guys are in a position to really get the word out there well, and Sandy they have this. said she yeah. gets thousands of messages every week from yeah. kids oh, yeah. from ohio yeah i never thought this was possible how do i get started well, you yeah. know the, the problem you know below deck i've known captain lee for over 30 years and uh, he's, 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 he's another, another great captain. captain this is what's amazing with below deck the captains are professionals. Are really good. So yes. when, you, when you look at it, and you know we're involved in below deck, we, we do a lot of the training for them. Hmm. So if the training, if the guys coming in, girls coming in, don't have training, they've got to come get the regulatory training before they can go sail. Right? It makes sense. Oh, so that's where uh, those crew members hooked uh, up was with you. Oh huh? no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, below deck is at you know there's an old thing that says you know any publicity is good publicity. Right. So it does bring a, a spotlight to our industry. But I don't, I'm not really think the average person thinks that's real life. I mean, it's a reality TV show, but so is Survivor, so is Big Brother, so are any of these other shows that are on TV. Does, do, anybody, do any of us think that that's how life really is? That's not my reality. Well, I think, I it think certainly we, isn't yours. We can, <laughs> we can learn from that. The, the problem that I've experienced is, and I'm a member of more committees than I tend to admit to, plus <laughs> more, more associations and unfortunately all the renewals come in on the same month in November and I go, stroke them all, right? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm spending you know, a lot of money and really, what are they actually doing? Uh, I know I personally 
can't make enough money out of going to schools and selling the concept. I'm happy to put an hour a month into it, but, but it would have to be through, through an association right. who's funded and has somebody that can go out and do this. And that, I believe, is the way forward. And do what? But, uh, to go to the schools and the colleges to inform and, 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 and recruit. This is what IMSS for sort of doing, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah, this starts in it. Well, the career starts, days. The because career there is days. No, we, do yeah. a lot of, we do a lot of outreach in local communities and things. So it, boys it, and girls clubs. What's this JP County. thing? The, the junior achievement thing? Yeah. Or, yeah it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of groups that are looking at target demographics of, of age groups of people. And there's a lot of kids come out of college that really are kind of wandering. Yeah. They're lost souls. Yep. They don't really know what direction they want to go. Sure. And they've got what a four-year degree, degree that they can't degree. use. Exactly. <laughs> perfect uh, target. They, they're, you know, they're a perfect target. Uh, going after them, educating them, and bringing them into the industry, you know, they're smart. They're educated. They went through college, so they're somewhat you know, committed to, uh, to improving themselves. Uh, and they're willing to, uh, to learn and, and experience new things. And the amazing thing is, the jobs in this industry are here. Well, the, you know, we not only is it a job, know. but it is also, and going back to what Mark said very early in the discussion, it's a career. You know, it's a way that you can actually progress hmm. and you can spend, this is a job for life. If you want to do this, this brings travel, this mm. is great salary points. You know, there's not many jobs that you can well, come out and make the kind of money with, you can make. With the career side, you know, I think where a lot of crew don't see the larger picture besides moving up the ranks, you move off to other things, you move off to become owning a an agency or a management sure company. Yeah. And there's crew who have been recognized by owners of yachts to have incredible talent and move them into their corporate Entire offices. Yeah. yeah. Or well, and this is, to this estate is management, this to is hotel this management, to all these other fun yeah. things that these owners have. They do open doors. The, this is that circle that you spoke about, accurate or not, but this is this is what I'm looking at more. It's as one circle. If, yeah. if, <laughs> it's more like many circles. It's like the Olympic the, rings. The significant oh, partner is moving ashore, and we know that they were great with their accounting, and they they were always punctual. Well, come work for me. Right. right. Move into your shore side business. Stay, we've looked. We've stay looked out for them. The right. yeah. And we you see can that then too. stay connected to the your partner and know what's going on in that boat, and you guys can start planning things, and you can help direct us. This is what I think is magical about Fort Lauderdale. This town is the boat industry. This is the supply center for yachting yeah. worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what separates us from Antigua or anything yeah. like this. Although they have the supply chain, they don't have the... Everything the, comes together here. They and don't again, have the space it, that we have. So okay. parking and, and trucks being able to get alongside the dock and all that sort of thing. Shipyards, nobody, crew agencies, nobody else in the world facilities, has that. management companies. Nobody else. So well, we and are, the boat show. And, and the boat show, the largest in the world. Phil always says that the Fort Lauderdale boat show is one of the only boat shows in the world where the... You can go and buy a boat from here, and you can go and get it serviced there. You can go and get it yep. painted here. You can go and do this. You can, do that. You you can, can do go that. get your crew. You can get your management. You can get your payroll done. Everything exactly. at one stop shop at the yeah. boat show. Well, yeah. Unlike Monaco, right. which does nothing for the town, <laughs> but the boat show here is everything for the town. The, mar the marine industry in South Florida is the economic engine of South Florida. Exactly. 38% yeah. of the economy, yep. give or take, is devoted to marine yep. uh, you know, businesses of one type or another. So it's absolutely huge. Um, so I think we've touched on a lot of great things. Um, I yeah, we do need to um, end because yeah. we are beyond our hour. I just want to say I just want to say one more thing, and that's because um, in the last two weeks I have been working 18 hours a day on behalf of a group called Yachting Yacht Aid Global. And what we have done in terms of motivating crew and getting crew and yachts and owners together to do something that's really good for the Bahamas and for all of us, mm -hmm. is a motivating factor. And I think we don't often think about that, about what crew can do. So, you know, I think this is a great start. And I would like to see the entire industry come together and invest a little bit more in some of the concepts that, that we have talked about here, whether it is um, doing great things for humanity, whether it's uh, motivating and training our crew to be more professional and getting more people into the business so that yep. they can have training and they can come and sit with Lee in a few years. <laughs> and sit on a Yeti. Yeah. It's, well, you know, there are some crew. That, uh, he's not crew, he's a, a boat cleaner. And so he came over from the Philippines um, and started cleaning boats. And he couldn't speak a word of English. He said, I clean boat, I clean boat. Do you want any boat clean? I clean boat. His interview was terrible. But two, three years on, he's now running a company with five employees out there every day cleaning boats. This town Fantastic. has the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just, just the one more example of the unbelievable amount of career opportunities there are in absolutely. Yachting. Hmm. All right, so how do we sum up? Because for me, what I would like to put out there is 
not necessarily to crew, but to everybody else in the industry. Everybody does paint or does um, the electronics or supplies the props. When we see crew at a boat show, do we let them cry on our shoulders? Do we give them a <laughs> thumbs up, thank you for your service type thing? I mean, well, how should we I, th I think the industry, the industry as a whole, whether it's owners, whether it's peripheral systems, whatever, they have to recognize crew as professionals. And sort of the That's crew. it. Well, crew have to act as professionals, too. They have to act as professionals, they have to well, be professionals, yeah. and they're perceived as professionals. It is a profession. Yeah. It is. You know, that's one hundred percent. It's a career. It's a profession. If you want to, if you want to make it that, right. um, I've chosen to make it my career. It's Me my too. passion. I love it's it. It's been my career. And I think if, you know, as I don't know who was saying it before, but a lot of the officers and people who come up the ranks, this is what they want to do. It's yep. they love it. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I never have life. done anything else. So on You've that lead, I'm sorry, I got to head on to my next yeah. meeting. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Our you. Pleasure. Really done. great. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank you. That was great. Oh. Thank you, everyone.